How did life begin? And today we have a guest, Steve Benner, and we'll be asking him questions about the origin of life. This is a huge field, and people just wander through it saying that they're working on the origin of life when actually what they're doing is having fun with something that struck their fancy. Yet man's search for a scientific answer to this question has challenged his imagination and his skill through the ages. Perhaps even if all the work goes exactly as planned, everything turns out well, they won't have actually learned anything about the origins of life. The early organic molecules may have evolved from the non-organic soup into more complex molecules and suggested that life came from non-living matter. You'll discover that in this field, settled science for the longest time has not considered the mineral environments of the processes that might allow RNA to form. Did life perhaps arise somehow from the non-living mud of a river? So for brief periods of time, after large meteors hit the Earth, there was a window of opportunity where life could have emerged, combining now the oxidized minerals and rocks on the ground, like borate and the carbohydrates they generated with the bases like adenine and guanine. Elisa Biondi here at the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution has done experiments showing actually that you can, rocks can make long RNA molecules. These rocks that she's using are clearly present on, on early Earth, and she does not need either pure starting materials or constant human intervention to get, to get these things. In this ooze emerged the first life. I find it problematic in that there's an extrapolation from a very small experiment in a laboratory. Researchers have now created life from non-living parts. There were many kinds of molecules in the primordial soup. I'm boiling up some primordial soup. Your entire civilization, it all begins right here in this little pond of goo. I've already discussed how ridiculous it was for Steve Benner to align himself with Dave Farina, and I'm sure he's regretting it now. And you're gonna regret it even more by the time I get done with this part right here. We talked about how Steve Benner critiqued my video to Dave Farina without even watching the video series. He didn't even know what was in it, multiple things. He accused me of saying that I never said at all. In fact, I said just the opposite of what he had suggested. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at Steve Benner's actual origin of life research and how it suffers from excessive human involvement chemistry, something that he himself criticizes. Because what he does is he relies on somebody else to do the human involvement chemistry. He takes parts of what other people have done with massive human involvement. He says, I, I never did it. So therefore, my chemistry it doesn't have human involvement. No, that's not true. You relied on somebody else. It was done in another lab. His chemistry only forms traces of material that he himself would not and cannot ever use, and we'll show that. And he therefore demonstrates that his own work is irrelevant to prebiotic chemistry. Let's talk about the origin of life. Sure. I want you to see what I see. You listen to these people like Steve Benner, like Lee Cronin, and you say that they don't hype things up. The press does, but not them. The blame belongs to the press. And when do you think that will happen? Hopefully within the next two years. But that's the mistake. What I'm going to show you, I will show you their actual research. So learn with me. I want you to see what I see and why you look at a paper and you read the abstract and you say, see, these guys have done it. This is a long paper, but one can just skim the abstract. For anyone who actually takes one full minute to read the abstract, from the abstract, we can see that a variety of organic the abstract outlining how mixtures of He isn't debunking his own field in the abstract of his own paper. Try to follow with me the data, not what they say. 
but what they actually made. Mikhail Jun Kim here also at the foundation has shown how borax minerals in dry valleys, and you can think Death Valley as an example of modern earth where this kind of chemistry would have taken place. They can make nucleosides for RNA, that is the building blocks of DNA and RNA. They can make the triphosphates uh, also without human intervention. And uh, we know a lot about the rocks containing borax that they allow the formation of otherwise unstable carbohydrates, which was one of the big points that Tour was mentioning. Right. Yeah, I think carbohydrates, he tries to knock that out because that's one of the classes. And then also another class, nucleic acids rely on carbohydrates. So definitely not really telling the whole story uh, on his side when he omits this kind of research. So here Steve Benner says in his little foundation there with doctors Kim and Yandi, that they've been able to make carbohydrates, that they've been able to make nucleotide triphosphates without human intervention. Well, we're going to see what he made. Now, Dave believes him. Dave says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tour tries to knock out carbohydrates. You guys have made carbohydrates. Definitely not really telling the whole story uh, on his side. Dave, you think he made carbohydrates. Just look with me at the data, specifically that these carbohydrates that he made are prebiotically irrelevant. This work of Kim and Benner on carbohydrates was utter nonsense. And the work of Biondi had massive human involvement because she bought everything because she couldn't make them. We'll talk about this. And so here's a typical background on organic synthesis versus relay synthesis. Here's the way synthesis is normally done. You take A, you mix it with B, and you get a number of compounds. A, B will couple together. You get AB1, AB2, you get a number of different compounds. Say AB4 is the one you want. Then you will separate out AB4 from the mixture of compounds. You purify that, and you'll take AB4, mix it with C, then you get AB4C1, AB4C2. Maybe this is the compound that you want. Then you separate this out and bring it on the next step. All right? Then you, you, you get the compound you want, you separate it out and bring on the next step. This is the way synthesis is done. Here's the way people who work in the era of origin of life do synthesis. And remember, if you, here's what they do. They take A and B, they make the same series of compounds, and then they never purify this because it's in such a mess they can't purify it. How would early earth go about purification? Well, it might crystallize. It might. We'll try to crystallize it. Go ahead. Well, they don't. Then they say, ah, we see AB4 in there as a little blip on my HPLC, so it's in there. It might only, only be a tenth of a percent, but it's in there. So I will go ahead and buy AB4. I will purchase it, and it'll be chiral, homochiral impure, 100% in antiomeric excess, or as good as you can get. I will buy it that way, and then I'll go on. Well, wait a minute, that's cheating. They isolated that from a natural source, and then they took it on. And, and, and now he, take, he or she takes it on, and they get a mixture of different compounds. Say this is the compound that, do they, that they want. They will say, ah, it's there. I see it. Now they will go ahead and buy this. So they put upon the early earth constraints that they would never be able to deal with. The heck with early earth. That's early earth's problem. Not my problem as origin of life researcher. Not my problem. That's early earth's problem. You see how unfair that is? It's cheating every step. Nobody could get away with a synthesis like this. Nobody. He talks about his work, and this work that he talked about in Dave's video series is in a big review article that he wrote with doctors Kim and Biondi, and it's called Prebiotic Chemistry That Could Not Not Have Happened. It's an interesting title. But in any case, he talks about the making of carbohydrates. Interestingly enough, as he talks about making these, he talks about the dealing with the Cannizzaro reaction. It is pointless to cite every extraneous reaction that was potentially happening at that time, as useless products were simply not selected by nature. Cannizzaro reactions would not lead to the type of molecules which are known to self-replicate, and thus would not be selected for by molecular evolution. Only happens with bases that are prebiotically irrelevant, like calcium hydroxide. Why Jim would, would call upon a calcium hydroxide? It's too strong of a base. You say that Panazaro reaction doesn't really need to be considered. Here you got him in his own figure talking about the Panazaro reaction and even labeling the Panazaro reaction as being a problem. He also shows in this paper that he's able to make these carbohydrates. Well, is he really able to make these carbohydrates and use them? And then he has this compound here, this triphosphate, that he's going to make triphosphates out of this, but he doesn't really do it. He says Krishnamurthy has already worked that out. Krishnamurthy worked that out in the year 2000. Okay, so he's relying on Krishnamurthy 
to have worked this out. Benner himself doesn't work it out. He relies on Krishnamurthy, who worked it out in 2000. One of the citations in that paper is the carbohydrate synthesis, this work of Kim, which Benner refers to in the Farina video. Hey Dave, I'm not bringing in anything here except what your own expert brought in. I didn't just go grab this paper out of nowhere. He talked about the carbohydrate synthesis, which you said. You said James really doesn't, doesn't uh, you know, he claims the carbohydrates haven't been made and he just discounts this. Right, yeah, I think carbohydrates, he tries to knock that out, though definitely not really telling the whole story uh, on his side when he omits this kind of research. No, here's the carbohydrates, synthesis of carbohydrates in mineral-guided prebiotic cycles. And so you would see that title. Here's what happens to you, Dave. You're the victim. You see that title. You say, you see... Kim and Benner have made it. Look at the title, Synthesis of Carbohydrates and Mineral Guided Prebiotic Cycles. They must have made it, there's the title. That's the title of the paper, so you're wrong and lying, you know. Okay, walk with me through the data and see what they actually made here. Let's look at the data, not the title, but see what they made. Here's their own abstract in this paper. One present obstacle in the RNA first model for origin of life is an inability to generate reasonable hands-off scenario for the formation of carbohydrates under conditions where they might have survived for a reasonable time once formed. Look, he's saying carbohydrates under the very conditions in which they are made don't stay around long. Why don't they stay around long? Because they undergo the Kinazaro reaction and they undergo polymerization. Your own guy, your own expert is agreeing with me, not with you, with me. Remember how many times I said time is a problem in organic synthesis and you've contested with me on that? He shows how clueless he is when he repeatedly brings up issues about equilibria and stability, insisting very emphatically that all these molecules must decompose over long periods of time. This is why I say time's a problem because under the very conditions which carbohydrates are made, they decompose. So 50% of what he made, the, the yield is bad, but anyway, 50% of what he was ma what he made was gone after two days you think time's a problem i think so time is a problem because the very conditions that are used to make organic chemicals compounds decompose under those very same conditions time is a problem in synthesis time causes s synthetic degradation time is a problem under the very reactions that is, are used to form them, they decompose. And so what you have to do, the chemist has to go in there and pull it out, fish it out from those reaction conditions when, it, when it's optimized. Ribo, ribose-based systems like RNA are, are chemically very unstable and it's not going back. Under most of the pHs, he got zero yield. Under some of the pHs, he was able to get a yield, but then it declines. You think time's a problem? It is such a problem. That's why I, every slide in that video, I didn't understand. It didn't make any sense to me. Every slide was wrong. That's what I was saying. Every slide, Dave, in your first video series was wrong. And then you came out, in your first video was wrong. Then you came out with a two-part series, and every slide in that series is wrong. This is why it, it, it's taken me so long to go through this, because every slide is wrong. That's the title of the paper, so you're wrong and lying, you know. You read the title of this without even understanding it, and you didn't even realize that this guy, your own expert, agrees with me that the molecules don't survive. But then he goes on to say, here, we provide detailed chemical analyses of carbohydrate pre-metabolism showing how borate, molybdate, and calcium minerals guided the formation, and then he lists out several sugars, particularly pentoses, which is what we're going to need for RNA. One other thing he says is over long times, material is expected to have passed from borate-bound pentulosis to a branched heptulose, which is susceptible to Kanazaro reduction to give dead-end products. So here he says that the Kanazaro is a big problem, so you've got to stop saying it. Or are you going to dig in your heels and say, Kanazaro is not a problem? Your own expert says Kanazaro is a problem. And here's another slide that he shows. This is the crazy amount of chemicals that he's showing. And let me tell you, every one of these stereo centers is randomized. I mean, it's just an utter mess. No synthetic chemist is even going to know what to do with something like this. So now we go into the details. If you had looked in his paper, you go to table S1. That means it's buried in the supplementary. But what's the base that he's using? Oh, look at that. 
calcium hydroxide again. Now he uses calcium deuteroxide, which is the same as calcium hydroxide, it's just a different isotope so that he can look at this by NMR. But this is calcium hydroxide, the very base that Dave, you said, was irrelevant. Almost everything James said in his series was totally irrelevant to abiogenesis. The fact that it degrades is irrelevant. Chiral-induced spin selectivity, totally irrelevant. The variability in enantiomeric excess is irrelevant. The yield, again, is totally irrelevant. In general, this is irrelevant. It is also totally irrelevant. Correct. And also irrelevant. You said it was irrelevant, and then you used it in one of your own slides, as I had showed you. Then you brought on your expert, Lee Cronin, and he used it, and you even put it on one of his slides, and you didn't even notice it. Calcium hydroxide, right there. And now your next expert comes in here, and he's doing uh, uh, carbohydrate synthesis, and he's using calcium hydroxide. So which is it, Dave? So the work of, of Benner is relevant on that basis, or is calcium hydroxide relevant? Where are you gonna dig your heels in now, Dave? You see, this is what I'm saying. Everything Dave is wrong. And rather than to learn something, he just has to dig in his heels because if he should ever, if he should ever show that he's just a little bit wrong, I mean, for Dave Farina to eat humble pie, never, never. He will just dig in his heels forever on this thing. And so I, I have uh, somewhat of an elevated ability to comprehend origin of life research. Calcium hydroxide, another one of your experts, not mine, your expert brought it in. He says that D-ribose, D-ribose in calcium hydroxide has a half-life of five hours. Remember, prebiotic chemistry takes a long time. These reactions have to go for long periods of time because there's no one there to fish it out when it stops. After five hours, half of D-ribose is gone in the presence of calcium hydroxide, which your own experts say is a viable base. Now, you add in some of Benner's rocks that he likes, now you can get it to last for less than two days is the half-life, 45 hours, which is less than two days. You think two days is, oh, they, you know, it'll certainly be fished out by then. No, we're talking about long spans of time for abiogenesis. You yourself say that over millions of years. It took millions of years. Millions of years these things happen. These reactions, so 50% so of what you make, if you should make D-ribose under these conditions, decomposes in five hours. If you're on the right kind of rock, you have two days for 50% of it to decompose. That means this is a twinkling of an eye in prebiotic time frames. This is your own expert's data. I didn't fish this paper out. He brought it in. This is what you guys were talking about, his carbohydrate synthesis. So I digress a minute on calcium hydroxide. I mean, just you were wrong again and again. So let's look at the ribose that Benner claims to have made. Now I want you to see, Dave, why I don't think his formation of ribose is relevant at all. You think it's relevant because you read the title of the paper that's saying, Synthesis of Carbohydrates on Mineral-Guided Prebiotic Cycles. That's the title of the paper, so you're wrong and lying, you know. Now, here's what a spectrum of D-ribose should look like. I just got this on the internet. Now, D-ribose can have an open form, it can have a closed form, it can have a six-member ring or a five-member ring, depending on what's say. And that's why you have a few little extra peaks here, but this is about what it should look like. Now, I'm gonna show you from Benner and Kim's own paper what their ri D-ribose look like. Now, if you're a synthetic chemist, I'll bet I'm going, to, I'm going to show you a C13 NMR. This is not a proton NMR. This is a C13 NMR of his reaction mixture. Now, synthetic chemists, I dare you. I dare you not to laugh when you see this C13 NMR. I'll, I'll, I'll bet, I'll bet you, you can't look at this without smiling, and then you're going to start laughing. When you look at this C13 NMR of the so-called D-ribose synthesis. Ready? Here it is. <laughs> this is, this is knee-slapping funny to a synthetic chemist. Here's what it should look like. Here's what Benner publishes. C13 spectra showing the formation of ribose borate from glycoaldehyde in C13 formaldehyde in the presence of borate. This is his mineral-guided prebiotic synthesis. This is what he gets. This is not noise. This is what noise looks like down here. This 
is not noise. Every one of these little peaks is another compound. Every one of them. It's just like your expert Lee Cronin said. Within seconds, you get billions of products. Remember you said seconds to an hour, you get billions, billions of products, literally within a few seconds or hours. And one of these, one of these is ribose. One of these in here is ribose. This is utter junk. And he claims he got it, and I claim it's probably in there. But you've got so many other things. You've got the enantiomer of that, you've got all the diastereomers, you've got the larger ones, the smaller ones, the solids that are precipitated out. You've got so much junk in there. It's just like Benner had said earlier. He said making molecules is one goddamn problem after another in that side of it. And you say, well, why don't you just run it longer? Steve, D Dave would say, just run it longer and your autocatalytic cycles would kick in and this would just get purified and this would go to the one that life needs. At the end of many cycles, all the useless impurities that are not reproducing will have purged themselves spontaneously. In this case, it needs ribose, so it's going to go to ribose. In another case, it needs another sugar. And so it's going to go to glucose in another reaction because it knows it needs that. So it's just going to go toward that and everything else will go away. And the other enantiomer problem of that, the L-ribose, that's no problem. That would also sift out as well. So this is why I say, Dave, that what he's doing is irrelevant. This is absolutely irrelevant. Remember I said that they get a gazillion products. I just listed six. No, I'm talking about a billion. And they see a little indication that it might be in there. And then what does he do? He goes on to the next step. Well, where did he get the ribose for his next step? Did he get it from here? No, it's impossible. Today, it is impossible with all our analytical techniques to fish that thing out. And somehow an early earth did that in one of your little ponds next to the ocean. It was able to sift that thing out. I mean, think about that. See from my perspective why I say he didn't get it and you say he did. But what he got was irrelevant, absolutely irrelevant. And now you synthetic chemists who look at C13 and Mars for a living, get up off the ground, just calm down. I know it's funny. I'm laughing with you. ¿Cuál es el trabajo más duro que has hecho? Y me llama el cocinero. Richita, ¿qué? Ve por la paellera. Venga, que las dos de la tarde ya están aquí. Miren, bañado. En las chanclas. Todo despeinado porque no me dio tiempo de nada ponerme las chanclas y el bañado. Voy a la playa, había subido la marea. Eso. Eso. I mean, most people would hide this in the supplemental, but not Kim and Benner. I mean, they just put it on out there, just unabashedly, they put this thing out there. But this is just laughable, utterly laughable. I bet Sutherland is laughing at this. Steve, you criticize John Sutherland's work? I mean, Sutherland may have five compounds that he might make in his human-involved reaction. You have a billion compounds in your non-human involvement. You might want to start getting involved a little bit here. Dave, did you receive this as being a prebiotically relevant synthesis of ribose? I do not, because it is useless for any further reactions. It is a dead end. That's why I say it's useless. He tries to claim that nothing has happened since Miller-Urey, but it's like there's been 70 years of, of incredible progress. So, I mean, given that, well, what do you make of his, of his criticisms? 
Yeah, yeah. So Tor, Tor is, is more clever than many creationists like Ken Hovind, who I think you have, have argued with. He does not start yeah. by advocating transparently false things like New Earth creationism, for example. But instead, he starts by appropriating arguments against sort of classical practice in prebiotic chemistry. And these are arguments that actually originated from the scientific community itself. Um, and, and, and this is a very good rhetorical strategy for him. How do you, like, what, which one specifically? Well, okay. So, I mean, he has got a nice chart showing that, or saying that all prebiotic chemistry just is a bunch of chemists in the laboratory mixing ultra pure compounds that they bought commercially and under very strict control, making a mess and then extracting from the mess, you know, a few compounds that may have biological relevance and then uh, claiming that this has something to do with the origin of life. So Steve, you just said you made ribose. Well, you made it in a sea of stuff that was utterly useless. And then you go on, in your very same paper, you use ribose. Of course you bought this ribose. You didn't fish out what you got. This is made from a natural source. This is now prebiotically irrelevant because you never really made ribose. And you say, well, I don't have to start ribose because it's already been made. They don't have to synthesize all of their materials from scratch in order to investigate that one problem. You didn't make it. You didn't make it in any useful form. It would have been irrelevant. And then you were directed to reference 48 in Venner referring to a Krishnamurthy et al. So you refer us to a Krishnamurthy et al. for this particular chemistry. You want to go from here to here, and you refer us to Krishnamurthy. Okay, so here's what's happening. Steve Benner sits there and tells us that he's made carbohydrates. He made a billion different compounds that were utterly useless. In fact, even, even Lee Cronin said, you make these under these conditions, it's useless. It's still a bit too complex for us to interrogate. It's useless. I don't care if he had his little borate rocks. It didn't do anything. <laughs> Look at that NMR. There's so much there, you can't deal with it. He himself couldn't separate it. So he goes ahead and he buys ribose. He actually says, we don't have any human involvement. Yeah, why doesn't he have human involvement? Because his human involvement comes by Krishnamurthy's reference. He refers us to this Krishnamurthy paper. In Benner's paper, he says, see reference 48. You see reference 48. There's this Krishnamurthy paper from the year 2000 in Angavanti Kemi, where they take this amidotriphosphate and they make this cyclic phosphate because he wants to be able to get this. Well, this is where the human involvement is. You know what's involved in making this? You know what's involved in doing this reaction? We'll see. Benner says, my lab, we don't, we don't have human involvement because you just committed the human involvement to another lab. And you just cited their work, only Krishnamurthy references. And so where did Krishnamurthy get this ribose? Well, he doesn't specifically say, but he says it's like when they made threos, and threos we got from Sigmund Aldrich, meaning he bought it. <laughs> of course he bought it. And Steve, do you know where this reagent comes from? This amidotriphosphate, do you know where this comes from? You don't know. I bet you don't know. As Dave would say, Uh-oh, someone didn't do his homework. Because if you'd looked at my video, you would have see seen that I talk about this. I talk about this iamido diphosphate, which is actually the preferred reagent by uh, Krishnamurthy. And you would have seen my discussion on that in my last video. So here's the Krishnamurthy paper in Angavanti Kimi. And here's the amido triphosphate that Steve Benner is making reference to. And here's the diamido phosphate that is the preferred reagent. So he says the specific phosphorylation reagent in this process is amidotriphosphate, a compound known to be formed by amenolysis of cyclotriphosphate, metatriphosphate in aqueous solution. So he says this is known. People have accepted this as being prebiotically relevant. You know why they accepted it? Because they never tracked down the synthesis. I did. You can look at number four. Or they will use this one preferably, this diamidophosphate. We also found that a comparatively efficient regioselective phosphorylating agent can be brought about with diamidophosphate, DAP, instead of AMTP, this amidotriphosphate. 
as the phosphorylating agent. In the case of aldofuranosis, there's even a preparative advantage with regard to this. So Crystal Murthy actually prefers this one. So you can go to his references here. Here's these references. I actually went through and looked at these references. I bet you didn't, Steve. Here's the chemistry in the Angavanti paper. He's taking ribose, now in the six-membered ring form. It's gonna open and close, and he can react it with the amido triphosphate that Steve likes to use, and he gets a 17% yield of this, 17%. And then he has to fish that out. He fishes out that 17%. Remember Steve Benner criticizes people like Sutherland? Crystal Murthy and Eschen Moser, just like Sutherland, people that do exacting chemistry, and says they have to do human involvement. We don't do human involvement. Yeah, because you committed this step to them and you used it as a reference. You see how cheating this is to say you don't do human involvement, but then you take the reagents that people have made and cite and say, you see, this is prebiotically relevant. And by the way, they made it with massive human involvement, but I'm not going to tell anybody that. This was 17% because you got 29% yield, 29% yield of a three to two mixture here, which means you got 17% yield of what you wanted. So that means you've got 83% of other stuff that you've got to somehow fish it away from and things that are not easy to separate from. Or if you want to use the more likely reagent, the DAP, which is the one they preferred, you'll get this in a 0.27 times 0.57 but it's functionally much easier to make this than it is to make this. And interestingly enough, there is magnesium chloride. Whoa. So in order to do the Benner chemistry, the amino triphosphate, you have to have magnesium chloride. Magnesium chloride, look at that. You know what magnesium chloride does? If magnesium chloride is around when he's gonna make his RNA, it's gonna cause the RNA degradation within hours within hours if you have magnesium chloride around. It's not gonna last. This is what these origin of life people do. When they wanna use one step, they'll use magnesium chloride. But now when he's gonna ultimately take a product and make RNA, he's gonna wash this thing like 20 times with ultra pure water to make sure there's no magnesium chloride around. They want magnesium chloride, it's there. They wanna get rid of it, it's not there. Well. 2.5% of the crust of the earth is magnesium. And so there's lots of magnesium too, magnesium ion around. But they scrub this thing out when they want to make their RNA. But when they need it in synthesis, they use it. Early earth has none of these advantages to scrub things out like this. These guys cheat like this all the time. This is your own guy. This is your own guy. I didn't cherry pick this guy, you did. And this is the work that he's citing in your video. I'm just looking at the data. now. You say you don't have human involvement. Yeah, because you committed to Krishnamurthy the human involvement. Here's human involvement from Krishnamurthy's group. When he goes from 13, compound 13, to compound 15 and 16, here's what's involved. He says he took D-ribose. Where did he get that? All we know is he said, look at it from an earlier procedure, and there he was calling it Sigma Aldrich. He bought this. He didn't make it, he bought it. And this comes from a natural living system. That's how they got this. He took D-ribose, was dissolved in water, and this sodium amido phosphate compound was added. How prebiotically relevant is this? Well, we're gonna see what's involved in getting DAP. Here he takes D-ribose, which he buys. He buys this from Sigma Aldrich, not the stuff that Steve Benner made or that anyone else made. He bought it, and this comes from natural sources. These guys cheat all the time like this. They never use what they make because what they make is junk, just like we saw with Steve Benner. He took this and he reacted with this sodium amido phosphate, and then he added this at room temperature, and so it was quite basic. So he has to lower the pH value, and he lowers it to pH 7 over a period of four hours by adding ion exchange resin. Where do you get an ion exchange resin on early earth? A batch of the DAP was added and pH 7 maintained as before over a 24-hour period. Subsequently, the pH of the reaction mixture was lowered to 6.5 and maintained over 24 hours. It's hard to carefully lower pH values. I'm telling you, you, you take water, you just add one drop of HCl to it, boom, that, the, the pH just drops dramatically. Here you have to slowly add ion exchange resin. This is full of human involvement, and Steve Benner says his chemistry doesn't have human involvement because he committed it to Krishnamurti. Yeah, he didn't do it, but you see how this is cheating? This is cheating. Your own words, Steve. Ignorant or lying or stupid or, or perhaps all three. Corrupt or 
Yeah. I didn't say this. These are the words you use. This is a self-fulfilling prophecy for you, Steve. This is the chemistry that's involved. In addition, a reaction mixture was diluted with 10 mils of aqueous triethylamine formate, filtered and washed three times. The washings were combined and subjected to ion exchange chromatography, so they're going through an ion exchange column and fractionated, and then they do the characterization of this. This is what's involved. This is the type of hands-off chemistry that we're talking about here. This is the type of hands-off chemistry that Steve says he has. Yeah, his hands are off, but Krishnamurthy's hands are on. Let me tell you what's involved in making that DAP reagent. And you need the preparation of this DAP. Where'd they get DAP? Well, they bought it, or they made it. So here's how you have to make it. You take phenylphosphorodiamidite. This compound you can't get from a prebiotic earth. You buy it. There's no way that they've shown to get, you know, these aerial rings on a prebiotic earth to be able to do this. Uh, and it was suspended in four molar sodium hydroxide. I mean, that's really basic, but okay, we'll give them that. And in ethanol, ethanol is not a prebiotic solvent. Dichlorobenethane is not a prebiotic solvent. Vacuum for two days is not a prebiotic method. So this is not made by a prebiotic root. You'd have to make this by a prebiotic root for this to be relevant. So you look up the synthesis of this. This is in the Watanabe paper in 1986. And Watanabe cites a paper from the late 1950s. It's not prebiotic by that route either. So this is just, you know, fine Waldo. I mean, just, just, uh, I'm going to wear you out by, by, by sending you to all these references. And, and then when you go there, it's not prebiotically relevant anyway. Steve, that was in my video series. And you watched my video series? You didn't watch it, or else you'd know that that was probiotically relevant. And I've even written about this. Have you ever read my writings on Origin of Life? Here's my complaints on this. And I wrote about this in the journal Inference in a paper called Much Ado About Nothing. And I say a third shortcoming lies in justifying the use of DAP to make the 5-hydroxyl into a suitable leaving group. In this study, DAP is described as a potential prebiotic phosphorylating agent. The authors have used the same reagent in several of the previous papers where they described it in the same manner. Any attempt to discern the prebiotically relevant synthesis that was used to prepare DAP quickly turns into a wild goose chase. Readers of the article are under review are referred to an earlier Krishnamurthy paper from 2017 that in turn cites the article by Albert Eschenmoser published in 2000. By the way, that's the one we were just talking about. It was Krishnamurthy and Eschenmoser, 2000. Eschenmoser, for his part, cites a 1986 article by Watanabe and Sato, even though they did not use a prebiotically relevant route. Eschenmoser also cites a 1957 article by Clement entitled, and here's the German name, Contribution to the Knowledge of Monoamido and Diamido Phosphoric Acids. This paper has nothing to do with prebiotic chemistry. It seems that DAP has become so ubiquitous in origin of life research that it is now simply accepted as being prebiotically relevant. Any effort to retrace the research that underlies this assumption leads nowhere. See, these guys send you on a wild goose chase. Well, we use this, these reagents, which are prebiotically relevant. They're not. They're not. You go look them up. There's no history in this to go back to a prebiotically relevant synthesis. Here's the paper they refer you to in the 1950s. It has nothing to do with prebiotic chemistry. And this is what you're talking about, Steve Benner? Shame on you. So what are some examples that you're uh, referring to specifically recently? Well... Yeah, let me thank him. There's a couple things that have happened over the past few years that I don't think Tor acknowledges, and he may not know about them. But so first, we have come to know a lot more about how rocks on the early Earth interact with organic molecules that were coming in from the early Earth atmosphere, how they interact. So, for example, we used to think that R ribose, which is the R in RNA, which is thought to be the first genetic molecule, was we used to think that ribose was impossible to get prebiotically. In fact, in 1996, Stanley Miller, the great Stanley Miller, made a comment saying that it was impossible to get. But now, you know, we've gone through a lot of understanding, improved understanding of what the early earth mineralogy looked like. Elisa Biondi here at the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution has done experiments showing actually that you can, rocks can make long RNA molecules. These rocks that she's using are clearly present on, on early earth, and she does not need either pure starting materials or constant human intervention to get, to get these things. 
The ribose you made was junk. And then you say your people don't need to have pure ribose or constant, constant human, human intervention, intervention to, to get, get these things. things. Not so. There was constant human intervention because you cite Krishnamurthy's work to do this. Krishnamurthy did the human intervention part, and we just read his experimental. Then Biondi makes long molecules, and you don't even have to have pure systems. That's a bunch of garbage. That cannot happen. And it's people like Dave that believe you. Dave believes you in this. And then you use the term corrupt. corrupt or would you call this corrupt? James has no excuse for being totally unaware of this aqueous chemistry. And you cite how Biondi is making these long RNA molecules, and Tour may not even be aware of it. How could I have been aware of it, Steve? You had not published that paper when you made this video with Dave Frina. It was not until 13 months, over a year after the making of the Farina video, the Biondi paper comes out. And you say, well, Tour may not even be aware of it. And Dave agrees with, yeah, J yeah James is, 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 is not really aware of current things. He only knows older things. Are you up to date on this stuff, James? How could I be aware of it? It was never in the literature. It didn't come out till over a year after Dave's video. You, you, Steve Benner, reference work and say, Jim may not even be aware of it. You reference work that isn't, isn't even in the literature. Your ribose is junk. You never even used the ribose that you made because you couldn't have. And then you talk about making triphosphates, making triphosphates, and you don't have to have pure materials there. She does not need either pure starting materials or constant human intervention. You cannot have impure systems. You don't demonstrate it, and that is absolutely impossible based on Carruthers' equation. You are doing a polymerization of what's called an AB polymerization. You have a 5-triphosphate on a nucleotide. You're trying to couple this with a 3-hydroxyl. 5 and 3-hydroxyl on the same molecule, so it's called an AB-type condensation polymerization. You absolutely have to have pure starting material. So when you make this claim that you don't need pure material, number one, you didn't demonstrate it with impure material in your paper. Number two, it is utterly impossible, scientifically impossible, based on what we know of condensation polymerizations. Violation of Carruthers' equation. It's scientifically impossible for this to be done without pure material. You have to have everything triphosphorylated. You have to have no other exogenous alcohols in there, no other amino acids that happen to be floating around. This is what origin of life people do. When they want amino acids around, all 20 of them are available. When they can't have amino acids, it, it's totally pristine. Elisa Biondi here at the Foundation for Applied Molecular Evolution has done experiments sh showing actually that you can, rocks can make long RNA molecules. These rocks that she's using are clearly present on, on early Earth, and she does not need either pure starting materials or constant human intervention to get, to get these things. That, Steve, is not true. That absolutely is not true. There was constant human intervention in the intermediates, and even those intermediates you didn't use. You bought your ribose triphosphate because you couldn't make it, and they were ultra-pure, and you ultra-purified your little rocks, you could not have gotten there any other way. What you're saying is not true. Ask any polymer chemist. 20 years of my career, I dealt with condensation polymerizations. I worked on condensation polymerizations. Any polymer chemist will be laughing at you to say that you can be using impure materials for these polymerizations. He then wants his audience to conclude that anyone who suggests otherwise is ignorant or lying or stupid or, or perhaps all three. Corrupt or, yeah. Exactly. What would you call such comments like ribose canal form and we don't need lots of human involvement? Rocks can make long RNA molecules. She does not need either pure starting materials or constant human intervention. And your suggestion of a statistical impossibility when you say that you can get these polymerizations with impure material. Would you say that anyone suggesting such things is it's ignorant or lying or stupid or, or perhaps all three? Corrupt or, yeah. Exactly. What would you call such a person that says such unsubstantiated, statistically impossible and loose comments as this. Dave doesn't know any better, but you, Steve Benner, you know better.
If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button, and that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, that's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work, and if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you.